Here we go. This is Catherine Valente at the Pasadena Public Library. Catherine, let's talk a little bit about folk tales and fables and why they're important and why they should, they're not just children's stories. So they never were children's stories particularly. Um, there, there didn't used to be such a strong dividing line between a story you would tell a child and a story you would tell adults. It's just a story that you tell. The stories that the storyteller who shows up at your village and wants dinner for the story he tells or she tells around the fire, uh, you know, that was just the stories. Um, fairy tales and folklore are, of course, slightly different. And there's a lot of disagreements as to what makes them each what they are. Folklore often has um, a very uh, clear teaching element to it. Uh, it tends to be about why the world is the way it is. Uh, fairy tales tend to have more cultural means and, uh, and then often tend to be women's stories. I think that's part of why they get a little denigrated. Uh, if you think about the, the dominant images in fairy tales, mirrors and shoes and spindles and you know, magical dresses, these are all traditionally associated with women. Um, but ultimately what a fairy tale is usually about is something horrible that's happening to a woman or a child. Um, and I mean, it really is. That's, that's <laughs> most fairy tales. Uh, or, or being done by a woman or a child. Um, but the children usually live through it. Women don't always live through it, but the children usually do. Uh, and it, unless it's Hatchet and Anderson, then they will die at the end. <laughs> but, uh, and, and I think that, at least for me, part of what I feel the value of fairy tales are is that they're stories of survival. They're stories about how to live through things. Uh, and that at the end of everything, you can still have a feast and a dance and a wedding, and, and that everything can be okay. which some people think is a lie, and therefore you get this idea that fairy tales, folk tales, fables, mythologies, that they're lies. Um, even all of those, world, those words are synonyms for untruth as in, in our modern English. They didn't used to be, but they are now synonyms for not telling the truth about something. Um, now, I'm a fantasy writer, which means that I don't necessarily tell the truth about much <laughs> of anything, uh, but I do tell the truth, uh, I, but I tell it slant, as a Mama Dickinson would say. And uh, I, I think that they are vastly important. They have been edited down over, the, over thousands of years to be the purest stories, the ones that are most human, that are about what it means to be human, what it means to be a woman, a child, a man, a hunter, a wolf, a girl in a red dress. Um, and if they, if they had not been absolutely the most distilled essence of valuable storytelling, of the images that move us on a basic level, they would have been forgotten. It's very easy to forget a story. It's hard to remember it. So that you remember the good parts. And the good parts are sometimes very bloody and violent. But um, I don't know if you've noticed, but kids like the bloody and violent parts. Uh, part of the reason I think kids don't read fairy tales as much these days is that we have boiled them down so far and cut all of the blood and sex out so that there's nothing to appeal to a child. And I got news for you, some of their obsessions and interests are, are blood and, and uh, vague, in, vague intimations of sexuality that they don't quite understand, but, but they, they see it going on in the world all around them. Um, I think that when you look at the modern world, you see people living in fairy tales. I mean, all of these couples that are infertile and go in for, for fertility treatments, every fairy tale starts. The king and the queen wanted a child more than anything else in the world but couldn't conceive. I mean, they, they, they are fairy tales that people are walking in. We love to tell the story of the people who come from nothing, Cinderella stories in our culture. We've just stopped calling them fairy tales anymore because if we call them something else, people will think they're true. Now, you've written Deathless, which is a retelling of a Russian fairy tale, and then the girl who circumnavigated fairyland in a trip of her own making is kind of an original fairy tale. Can you talk a little bit about the difference of working with an existing structure as opposed to creating your own? Sure. Um, well, so Deathless uh, is, is, is a retelling. Uh, so I did not want to change any of the plot. This is actually just my rule. Other people who retell fairy tales have no problem changing the plot, plot of a fairy tale. I try not to t change the plot. Now, that means that I found one version I like. There are many, many versions of, of all of these fairy tales, and particularly the one I used for Deathless, which is Maria Moravna and Koshe the Deathless. Um, Vladimir Prop in the morphology of the folktale, it is the fairy tale he uses to analyze fairy tales as a whole. There are many variations of the story. So obviously I found one I liked, and I stuck to that plot. Um, but Could you briefly just say what that is? Oh, sure. Uh, so Russian, it's important to know in Russian fairy tales that uh, everybody has the same name um, in, from, ta from tale to tale. It's always Ivan, uh, like Prince Charming, um, or Jack. And Koshe the Deathless and Baba Yaga are always in there. And the princess is usually named Yelena, sometimes Vasilisa, Yelena the Bright and Vasilisa the Brave. Um, but in this one story, she is Marya Moravna, which is very unique. Uh, so Ivan is going to visit his sisters, and he comes across a field of dead people, of dead soldiers, and he says, um, 
to whom do these dead belong? And the last dying soldier says, these dead belong to Mari Maradna, the queen, from, uh, the queen from beyond the sea. And he goes up to her tent, and uh, they spend three days in the tent, and they're married when they come out. So who knows what happens in there. Uh, she takes him back to her house, which is also very interesting. It's her house, and she says, you can go into any room, but don't go in the basement. So it's Bluebeard. Story where the Bluebeard is a woman, which I totally did. <laughs> and uh, when he goes in the basement, inevitably, Cushay the Deathless is down there chained up against the wall. Cushay is the devil of Russian folktales. He is incredibly powerful and strong. Um, he kidnaps maidens, that's what he does. Uh, and when my husband was reading this story to me, I, I didn't even get past that part. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why is he in a basement? Like, why is he chained up in a basement? My husband's like, I don't know. I, it's not part of the story. He was reading to me from a, a Russian uh, collection, and I was like, but that is the story. I mean, why? Did, did, is he there voluntarily? Did she overpower him? Did she do it on purpose? Like, what, what, what's going on in there? And, and he said, I don't know. There's like two more acts in this story, and he wants to go and get her when Koshe takes her to the magical country. I'm like, I don't care. Yvonne sucks. And he does. Yvonne, oh, I can't stand that dude. Um, so, uh, yeah, he, like, like, uh, Koshe takes her. He, he, he busts out of the chains. Um, when, when Yvonne gives him a glass of water. So apparently water gives him superpowers. I don't know. Or, yeah, whatever. I don't really care about that. But so I wanted to tell the story of how he got in the basement. That was <laughs> what I wanted to tell. <laughs> and, uh, and I had been, uh, Dimitri, my, my husband, uh, his parents had been living with us for quite a number of years. And so I'd been listening to these amazing stories of the Soviet Union and, and his grandmother's stories. Um, and so those things went together very naturally in my mind. I love to combine the modern world with fairy tales and show how we really do walk in these fairy tales over and over and over again. Um, they're very much uh, a valid part of our lives. And in Russian literature, there's a strong tradition of, um, of that kind of thing because the only way that you could critique the government back in the day was to write fantasy uh, or science fiction because obviously it, it's not real if you know, a bad fairy is doing it. Um, and so I, I, that, that's really the story I wanted to tell. And, and though I don't really care about Ivan, uh, I, I did, it, it, towards the end, his whole little story is played out as well. Um, and I, I wanted to just push that story as far as that, that one story that I did not make up as far as I could push it. Fairyland, on the other hand, um, is, it, it, it's a critique of a genre, it's a critique of portal fantasies, um, it, which is very obvious by the end. There's a, a strong little uh, jab at Narnia at the end. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, that the whole idea that these girls and boys who go to these magical countries would immediately want to turn around and go home, that's the thrust of those stories, they have to get home, so they're going the Yellow Brick Road to get home, which is slightly unfair to Baum because the rest of the books uh, of, of the Oz series are not about that particularly, uh, but the movie is what has, ki has captured the American mindset and the movie is all about that, uh, which I find very interesting actually, that, that that's the story we, we want to be told because it butters up our ego about our world, that our world is better, no matter how crappy and depression filled and dusty it is, it's better than, uh, than Oz. Well, I think that's crap. Uh, <laughs> if I was, uh, when I was a kid, if I found a portal to another world, I'd been gone. Uh, he, and I, I would never particularly have thought of going home unless things got really bad in the other world. Um, and so in Fairyland, there's a lot of um, sort of meta-commentary on fairy tales, and, but it also takes it ultimately extremely seriously because I take, I, I take fairy tales extremely seriously. There's a lot of creatures from different mythologies around the world, and, and, um, and September, the protagonist, thinking very seriously about how these stories work because she's read those stories and, and, and how she can act and not act like the, the stories that she knows. Was Alice in Wonderland at all? Oh, I'm a huge Alice fan. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I love Alice. And, and in fact, you know, um, in the sequel, I, I had to be, uh, I realized that I had, um, I had a rabbit. And I was like, oh, I can't have a rabbit. It's all, it's, it already skirts Alice <laughs> occasionally, so I, I had to change the rabbit. But, um, but yeah, no, Alice is a, a huge influence. But I, I mean, I, I'm, an, I think I'm a through the looking glass girl supposed to a Wonderland girl. And um, I love it so much I don't find as much to critique in it. I mean, I think that Narnia is problematic on a number of levels, and so is Lord of the Rings and Wizard of Oz and a, a lot of these other ones. But Alice is, Alice is just a book of my heart. What, what would you say is the problem, the, the larger problems with Lord of the Rings and Narnia? Well, there's no women in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, okay, I'm sorry, there's two. Uh, so sorry, three, uh, if you count Galadriel, but she does just stand still most of the time. So does Arwen, stand still most of the time. Um, and, and look at the Eowyn is a freak and treated as a freak, uh, who who stops being her manly self when she gets a boyfriend. 
So not great, uh, Mr. Tolkien. Uh, Narnia, the thing that bothers me about Narnia is not even particularly Susan, although I don't like that either. Uh, the woman cannot fight in war. Uh, yeah. <sighs> not even particularly the Christian stuff, even though, because I didn't notice that as a kid. I was, it was not clued in. I didn't get it. Um, but that at the end of the books, they're sent back home after having lived these long, complicated adult lives, and they're back in their children's bodies, and they don't go crazy. Like, they're fine with that. And that's not possible. I mean, if you, they, at the end of Line of the Witch in the Wardrobe, they're, they're grown-ups. They're in their 40s. And they're all of a sudden prepubescent again. Oh, that's a nightmare is what that is. Um, and so I really wanted to explore um, something that I really dig, one of my kinks in literature, is looking at all those fairy tale and folktale tropes and, and thinking about how real people would react if those things happened to them. You know, that Hansel and Gretel would never be okay. They would never be okay again, having gone through that. Um, and, and I don't think that any, anybody who, was, who had suddenly had their entire lives taken away from them. And of course, Lewis is Lewis, so none of them are married or anything like that, but they completely would be. They would be married. They would probably have children in Narnia. <laughs> And, and the, to be sucked back into uh, the Blitz, London, that's the worst thing ever. That's just that's so nightmarish. Yeah, that is a horror novel. That's the beginning of a horror novel. And, uh, and I really wanted to, to address that. So that is a strong theme in Fairyland, that that's fucked and not okay. That's not, that is not a nice way to end a children's story. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, um, I, I will not give away what character that is relevant to, but... Can you tell us a little bit about the sequel? Sure. Uh, so, at one point in Fairyland, September uh, trades away her shadow to save a little girl's life. And uh, these creatures called the Glashton, who are like Kelpies, they have big black horse heads and human bodies, and they live under, they live in Fairyland below, the land under Fairyland. Um, and they take her shadow down, uh, and in the sequel, the, her shadow has become the queen of Fairyland Below, Halloween the Hollow Queen, and, uh, and is, is having a great time uh, in Fairyland Below, stealing everyone's shadows from Fairyland, so September has to go and clean up her mess. How much of the imagery and iconographic stuff, I mean, how much of it is a commentary? Well, and it's a mixture. Okay. Like, a lot of it just comes out of my own head, and a lot of it comes from, from mythologies from around the world that I've found interesting. But even the mythologies that I find interesting, I usually tweak it in some way or another. I mean, there are not actually wyveraries. There's wyverns and libraries. Um, <laughs> uh, the Suku Megami, the, the creature, the household objects who turn 100 years old, that's a real thing from Japanese folklore. Um, Spurgeons are obviously real, as uh, Marids, uh, the, which are like water genies, they're real too. So a lot of the actual creatures are real, but um, a, lot of it, a lot of it is my own crazy head too. <laughs> and what do you want children to take away from the story after they've read it? To be brave and bold and to always say yes to the world. I think that those portal fantasies where especially young girls see this beautiful other world and they say no. They say they don't want it. They want to be safe and taken care of forever. They're saying no to the world, saying no to adulthood. Portal fantasies are very often about coming of age and becoming an adult. And to say no, to say no, I don't want it, is so wrong to me. You should always say yes. You should always say yes to the world. And yes, it is dangerous. And yes, bad things happen. Bad things happen to children. But you can't block the world out. And adulthood is a magical kingdom of wonderful things if you, if, if you can see it that way. Kind of like the, uh, the green goggles in, in uh, Wizard of Oz. And, and to, to always say yes. That would be my, my message to children. Be ill-tempered and harassed. <laughs> <laughs> you did mention briefly that you're working on a sci-fi novel. Could you just tease a little bit about I am. So I am <laughs> working on a deco-punk space opera that features an alternate science fictional version of old Hollywood. Uh, but it's based on the short story I wrote called The Radiant Card I Sparrows Drew, which is you can read on Clark's World. Um, and it's an extension of that story. One last question. What fairy tale do you want to tackle next? So what I really want to do is a companion piece to Deathless. Uh, not a sequel, but uh, a companion piece. Because as I said, in Russian folk tales, everybody has the same names but are doing different things in every story. So I want to retell the story of Ivan and the Firebird um, uh, set around the children's evacuation of Leningrad. So there was a children's evacuation just like in London, which is what starts Narnia. So I want to do this portal fantasy, but with old school, hardcore Russian <laughs> conflict <laughs> scene uh, and, and, and retell the story of the Firebird, which is probably the most famous Russian fairy tale. Uh, that's what I want to do next. I will be reading it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem.